You know, it's funny. I think I made a joke in one of my recently recorded videos about me not bothering to cover Dark Alliance because I didn't get a press key for it. And I didn't feel like pre-ordering it, but oddly enough, Microsoft drove straight into the pits of hell on my behalf and brought with it a souvenir from down below, in the form of Dark Alliance being added to Xbox Game Pass, presumably on day one. So I figured while I'm already paying for Xbox Game Pass, might as well download Dark Alliance via Game Pass and see if it's any good. Small spoiler, I think everyone can agree there might be one or two problems with this game. Well, setting aside maybe the YouTubers paid by the developers to publicly show for them, of which I did observe a fair number. And that's definitely not a good sign when you're a AAA game. If the only people you see promoting a video game are celebrities and YouTubers that are sponsored, you should take that as an inevitable warning sign. Luckily, you can rest assured I'm not one of those people. If for no other reason, then my channel is still fairly small, so thankfully I've not had to worry about the ethical dilemmas yet in regards to deciding which sponsors to feature in my videos or not. So, what is Dark Alliance? And perhaps more accurately, what is it marketed as? Because I do think there's a difference between how the game's marketed itself in the public and how the actual final product turned out. Dark Alliance marketed itself as being this four-player, third-person, dungeon-crawling action game, with a moderate infusion of hardcore RPG-esque mechanics, with an authentic D&D story that's loyal to the source material, while still being a satisfying casual action game that appeals to the general public at large, not just any one specific diehard audience. And to quote Star Wars, it's true from a certain point of view. Now I want to start off by observing some of the things this game does get right. Trust me, it's a relatively short list. First up is the generally high quality bar for the storytelling and dialogue on display here. Probably one of my favorite examples of this was how the trolls were really mor moronic and gluttonous, and how almost all they'd ever think about was food. I, I think I had two or three levels where just constantly you'd hear trolls in the background singing about eating dwarves. Hey boys, I caught one! I caught me a right plump dwarf, I did! Look at the size of them! That ain't no dwarf, dimwitch! Sure it is! Ain't it? Ah, throw them back! Bottom feeders! Bottom feeders? Yeah. Tastes like gravel shit! We can't eat that! Ah oh, no, those gray ones make me shit my pot! <laughs> so hungry! On the surface level, that might seem like it'd get annoying to some, and I almost found myself in that camp myself. But at the end, when you're about to go up against the final boss of that campaign, you find that you're actually facing off against the cook himself, who's been chopping up all the dwarves, the goblins, and trolls have been killing and bringing to him. And you see he's been turning their carcasses into a lumpy, nasty-looking stew. And for some reason, the joke just really landed with me. Yeah, I know it had a hell of a build-up, and I know I have a pretty dark sense of humor, I get that from my mother, but just knowing that however annoyed the player might have been by the constant singing and chanting and demanding for meat, knowing that the cook was easily ten times more aggravated than I was, knowing that most of the fire and lava I'd been seeing throughout the level up to that point was directly providing the heat for the cooks too, and that all the dwarves being killed were providing the meat in the soup, just in terms of comedic effect, it was a grand buffet of jokes. And yes, that was a pun, but it also serves as a double entendre, so I'll let it slide. The cutscenes are also really great. They're funny, they have cool moments that may not be jaw-dropping, but still leave you sufficiently immersed in the world and factions at large. All of it is really good stuff, really no complaints there. The combat system is a bit clunky, but by god does it give you a wide variety of moves. The only problem is that you have to grind like hell to unlock them all. If you don't have any unlocked, combat will be unbearably repetitive and innately predictable, but I'll give it partial credit for having potential. But it does depend on what you expect from it. The ultimate abilities for each character visually are quite fun to watch, although in terms of how they feel from a gameplay perspective, that's a different matter entirely. Also to a lesser degree, potions you bring with you can also really have an impact when used to full effect, but they're not exactly innovative. And as for the final somewhat positive credit I can honestly give the game, is that the boss battles are honestly one of the most enjoyable portions of any level. Although, again, if we're being honest, that's not saying a whole lot when you stop and think about it. 
Now, before we get into the negatives, of which there are an abundance and variety of, I should probably disclose something. I've only played Dungeons & Dragons, the actual role-playing game, twice in my life, while I was at my local community college working on my associate's degree, and the dungeon master we had at the time wasn't really all that exciting. He could have been just as easily reading aloud the economic section of the Wall Street Journal for all the enthusiasm he exhibited during our campaign. And at least partially as a result of those experiences, I never really got into the game myself. Dungeons & Dragons is one of those games where, number one, you do need a really good dungeon master, and number two, you need to be playing with your friends, or at least people you know well enough and get along well enough that you can have fun with. And I think that philosophy translates pretty well into gaming as well. It occurred to me that one of the things I think could have somewhat averted, or at the very least mitigated, the messy and unenjoyable mess that the gameplay ultimately proved to be, would have been integrating some variation of an AI director system, similar to Left 4 Dead 1 and 2. And now it's rather less inspired modern spiritual successor, Back for Blood. Plenty of games have historically taken similar approaches in recent years, and for Dungeons & Dragons specifically, I think as a potential game mechanic, it would have really solidified the connection between the game and the actual role-playing game. By introducing a vast slew of additional visible and invisible variables, either of which will help or endanger the player, it would have forced the group to react blindly to whatever new thing they were facing and make decisions that could prove either beneficial or detrimental to them all. You know what game did that really well? Hand of Fate 1 and 2. Both really fantastic games. I'm not usually one for card-based games. I dabble at best. But Hand of Fate definitely is one of the rare exceptions. And implemented a system nearly identical to the one I described. I don't know for absolute certainty that they had an AI director guiding what on a surface level appeared to be a merely chance-based campaign generation system, but I find it highly likely. Point being, that game, a relatively straightforward and modestly budgeted AA game, retained a deeper, more thorough understanding of the essence of D&D than this officially branded Dungeons & Dragons title. It shouldn't be this hard to create a four-player, third-person dungeon crawler based in the D&D universe that has decent gameplay, a compelling story, and characters you feel like you can actually embody. Probably the single most important thing I think would have really saved this game would have been a complete and utter rework to the overall combat system. This makes the combat from Marvel's Avengers look and feel as smooth as the free flow system in Batman Arkham Asylum. The time to kill for even the most insignificant of enemies is ridiculously long. Combine that with the fact that the levels tend to be very uneven in terms of enemy placement, and you end up with something that comes across more like an early pre-alpha instead of a supposedly finished game. We're led to believe that these heroes are among the mightiest of their respective races and factions, able to take down entire waves of enemies by themselves during cutscenes, yet when you actually play as them, oftentimes it takes between 10 and 20 seconds to eliminate a single enemy. I'd much rather the game drastically increase the number of minor enemies during these action-packed sequences and just correspondingly lower the health and armor of most average enemies, than have the reverse be true, as is the case now. Also, not that I think this would necessarily be a big deal if the game didn't already suffer in other aforementioned areas, but the game is insanely buggy. The amount of bizarre, immersion-breaking, and sometimes borderline game-breaking bugs blows me away. I've had instances where my character found herself stuck, unable to move, due to invisible barriers. Whenever you fall off the map somehow, like if you fail to make a jump properly during the platforming sections, you just instantly get teleported forward or back depending on what's closer. Reviving fallen allies when they get downed by enemies is inconsistent. Sometimes you need to spam E like half a dozen times before it registers. I and my teammates in one level had this odd issue where we were trying to pick up a lever that we needed to collect to complete a platforming requirement and it just floated there, with all of us completely unable to pick it up, despite the button prompt. And after like two minutes of desperate flailing, Two of us went off to try to see if we could find another way across without the lever. Almost the minute we left, the other guy finally was able to pick it up, somehow. No one really knows why or how. But easily the most aggravating moment in the entire game for me was this one boss who me and another player went up against. We had a hard time of it initially as it was an engaging boss battle, but after 5 or 6 minutes of running away, dodging, and closing in at opportune moments, we finally eliminated the boss, or so we thought at least. But things took a bizarre and somewhat unexpected route when we actually killed the boss, but then he reappeared again with full health, at the same spot he last appeared at. 
except this time he seemed to have suffered some kind of brain damage that incapacitated him permanently. So we eradicated him again with the same ease as one might crush an, a spider or an ant, and then he showed up again. And again. And again. Even a cat has fewer lives than whatever this thing was. At the end of the day, I can't say I strongly relate with the level of disappointment I know has been resonating throughout the D&D community, as well as the general gaming public who pre-ordered or bought the game on day one, expecting a decent AAA quality online co-op game set in the D&D universe, only to receive, again, whatever this is. If it hasn't been obvious to you yet, I cannot in good faith recommend this game at this time. I do know the developers have said that they pl have plans to support this game with new free updates, like introducing new bosses and other enemy types to the existing campaigns, as well as releasing paid DLC expansions at some point down the road. So I'm hopeful that they're incentivized to address the concerns of the player base, if for no other reason than to rebuild at least some of the goodwill they've shattered with this disastrous launch, in order to get at least some players to buy into the DLC packs when they inevitably release. I think this game is likely to improve, at least to some degree, a lot of the more glaring technical issues will probably be fixed, but for the life of me, I do not foresee this game ever being able to make any kind of significant turnaround. There is a reason why redemption stories are so rare within the gaming industry, especially when it comes to live service type games. Because the developers and or publishers cut off support almost the minute they receive any significant pushback. They might not immediately announce that they've done so, because you'll kill the chance for any additional copies to be sold, but you'll almost always see a cutoff point, after which point no additional updates are released. And it's only after that point, a few months down the road, the developer will officially announce that live support has ended. And I suspect we'll see the same here. I do not believe for the life of me that this game will receive the full one year of content updates originally promised on the roadmap provided by the developers. But if they do commit to atoning for the game's initially poor launch, and release not just bug fixes, but a healthy number of free major updates as a means of winning people back, I would consider giving this game a second look. But we're just going to have to wait and see what the future has in store for Dark Alliance. On that note though, that's where I think I'm going to wrap up the video for today. As usual, if you enjoyed this video or found it informative, please be sure to give this video a like, share it around, and definitely let me know what you think in the comment section down below. I'm always up for some healthy and vigorous debate in my comment section. We don't all have to agree, but as long as we can keep things fairly civil, I'm more than happy. If you want to support the work I do in the channel, subscribing and clicking the bell to opt into getting all notifications would really help. YouTube does not make it easy for people to find my videos. It only takes maybe two button clicks to subscribe and enable notifications. My goal is to cross over 2,000 subscribers by the end of 2021. Now, if I do meet that number, I plan to donate $100 to the Team Trees, Nonprofit initiative. It's a great cause, and I love the idea of how, as I grow and hit certain milestones, I give back to the rest of the world. If you want to join me in donating, great, but all I ask is that you subscribe and help inch me closer to fulfilling my pledge. Either way, thanks for joining me, as always. This is Warrior Dan signing out. Stay awesome, everybody. Stay safe and peace out.